how does your role at Chick-fil-A um, uh, work together with, with your role as an author? Well, uh, in the early days, I was writing on nights and weekends and they came to me and said, hey, you know, this is really good. And I said, I'm so I'm so thankful you guys think so. And they said, we want a book a year. And I said, well, there, there's one fundamental problem. It takes me three to five years to do one of these. And they said, well, you better get started. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I don't know how many nights and weekends I have. And so what they decided uh, almost 10 years ago was to carve out some of my day job is actually working on writing. So the answer, the short answer to your question is it works brilliantly because the organization is not only encouraging and resourcing these projects, but they're actually allocating some of my time to do the work. So it's been, it's been fantastic. Excellent. You mentioned earlier that sort of the shift, the first nine books being parable based um, and then the last two being, you know, more traditionally nonfiction. And uh, one thing that stood out about this one for me was two numbers. One was 5,000 and the other was 10 countries or 5,000 people in 10 countries. Tell us a little bit about the origins of this book and, and what these numbers mean. Okay. So one of the things I've always tried to do is to fight my own bias. Um, the bias I'm aware of, but I want to fight the bias I'm unaware of, right? The blind spots. And so one of the disciplines that we've tried to instill over the years, even when I was writing the, uh, the fable and business uh, fable format is we always, the team always starts with a, a look at what do we believe to be universally true about this topic across time, across space, across roles, across industries, across countries, because I want to, I want to be a purveyor of truth. And so in this particular topic uh, on culture, we said, let's do a global study. And we ended up, by the way, by the time we finished, we had over 6,000 people in our sample. That was both the quant research and the interviews the and the focus groups and this that and the other and so we talked to leaders and frontline uh, individual contributors from 10 countries over 6,000 folks to figure out what is universally true about organizational culture so that was the the bedrock of our work mm. and what surprised you how consistent things were across the globe, it was, it was uncanny. I think statistically, the numbers were almost identical around the world, which was crazy. I mean, there are some variation here to there. We asked a lot of questions and you could, but as a group, the, the consistency, which made us, it was excited us since we're gonna write a book about culture that we hope will serve the world that you can't say, oh, it's only true in the US or it's only true in Asia or it's only true in Africa, wherever. So we, we were all over the world. So that was one thing, a pleasant surprise, the consistency. Um, two more, because there was a lot. It surprised me, and this is not the first time we've discovered this, that senior leaders don't see the world the way their frontline people do. Now, at, some facets and aspects of that are probably okay, because senior leaders have a different role, right? And you would think, however, when you ask them simple questions like, is your organization a great place to work? They answer that 40 points higher than their frontline people. Wow. All over the world. Wow. And we have found that in other studies. And so at some point, I, I need to write about how to help leaders stay in touch with the realities of their people. But that number was, I was, I was shocked, surprised, and discouraged that the gap is, is so wide. But the final one I'll mention is that when we ask leaders about the importance of culture, about 70%, I think it was 60 some odd percent in the rest of the world and 72% in America. So about 70% of the leaders in the world said that culture is the most powerful tool at their disposal to drive performance. Now, that may or may not surprise you, but, but here's, here's the surprising part. We asked those same leaders 
to rank their personal priorities in, at work. And creating and maintaining culture came in at number 12. Wow. So, so it's, it's really the classic knowing doing gap. It's like, I know this is important. In fact, it's number one. It's the number one driver of performance. And there are 11 things ahead of it on how I spend my time. Mm. So that actually became our charge. How can we make this topic approachable, accessible, actionable? Because we realize one of the reasons they don't work on it is a lot of leaders don't know how to work on culture. And so that was actually the, the turning point in our work was when we said, we've got to try to close this gap or not, not lower the importance level because it's probably, it should be higher than 72%, but, but to help people move it up their priority list. And we think that if we make it actionable and approachable, uh, accessible, that, that hopefully we can do that. That's fascinating. So other than not knowing how to do it, you know, it, you go through this process with these leaders and... <laughs> Uh, some of it's done on surveys, some of it's done in interviews or small groups. If you confront them with, you know, these two facts, you said that culture was the most powerful tool available to you, but it's number 12 on your, you know, priority list. When you confront them with these two facts, what other sorts of things do they say? Well, they talk about busyness. They talk about complexity. They talk about competing priorities. They talk about resource uh, constraints, which interesting, uh, this is not intended to be a plug for my last book, but, but we wrote a book called Smart Leadership, which is built on the premise of helping leaders get out of the quicksand. Mm. And what we heard is there, we knew because of the previous project that so many leaders are in quicksand Working on culture feels like swimming lessons. They're drowning. How do you, how do you get somebody excited about swimming lessons if they're drowning? Yeah. So, so the, the, we heard a lot of that. Um, then there's some fear. There's a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of lack of clarity, which we, we get to later in this conversation. It's like, well, I don't know what kind of culture I want. So I can't declare it. I can't pursue it. So, so we heard, we heard a lot of things. It was, it was fascinating. 